um, part two of our webinar of confinement feeding. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today. Uh, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would like to extend that respect to all First Nations people here today. Tonight's webinar will be recorded, as I've also said, already said. Um, so if you'd like to rewatch it um, after tonight then, or you have any technical problems, it'll be made available. You'll have the chance as per last week to answer any questions, to ask any questions as we go through the presentation. Um, just pop your questions in the chat box uh, and we've allocated some time at the end to um, try and answer the questions as best we can. Funding um, to be able to present this webinar is from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Um, at the completion of the webinar, a short survey will be emailed out to you. Um, it would be appreciated if you could take five minutes to fill out the, um, fill out the survey. Um, and once again, this recording will be circulated in the next couple of days. So we'll send out the link um, once, once that's made available. So I'll just pass across to Brett Littler. Thanks, Peter. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us again tonight. Um, once again, we've got the uh, two Jeffs, Jeff House and Jeff Duddy, will be doing the presenting this evening. Um, this evening, we're going to go through and cover alternative feeds and byproducts fibre requirements, vitamins, minerals and additives. Also going to cover health, welfare, water, shade, shelter, budget, tools and calculators. So uh, without too much ado, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Jeff Duddy to uh, kick off this evening. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Brett. You hear me OK? Yep, Ken, all good. Welcome, everyone, for part two. Um, I'll be covering what's just there on the screen there. First up, alternate feeds, byproducts, a little bit on fibre requirements, vitamins and minerals, and some additives. Um, I would really recommend this is really just a summary of a lot of the information in the manual uh, and on the information sheet. So when they are available, by all means, um, contact the Central Table and LLS to download um, or get a copy of that manual. <clears throat> In terms of the alternative feeds and byproducts, there's a wide range. Um, they can be fed to both sheep and cattle, but we generally recommend that you use them with caution. Issues may include high moisture, low dry matter, and all feeds are based, all the cost of feeds uh, are based on a dry matter base. So it can be quite costly, and I'll show you um, an example as we go through of some of these feeds that are high in moisture. Um, high questionable cost benefit, low energy and or protein, low digestibilities and palatabilities, impaction and choking issues. Um, one that comes to mind is feeding potatoes. Potential poisoning risks, uh, transfer of weed seeds, any molds or off tastes or rancidity due to um, oil contents, odour issues, uh, mineral imbalances as we have with most of our traditional feeds. Neophobia or being scared of new things. Sheep and cattle are both neophobic. And importantly, chemical residues. Um, it's important to get a vendor deck um, and to really sort of check out uh, any potential chemical issues before feeding to the livestock. We're going to go through a couple of different tables. There's a lot of information. I'm just going to pull out of these tables a couple of examples and go into those in a bit more in depth. We're just going to look at holes and husks first up. You can see there in that column that protein levels are generally pretty low, as are our energy levels. Um, and I guess in summary, most of these would really just be in there as a fibre component. The example I'm going to use is almond holes, which quite a lot of feedlots use and dairies use. Um, quite low in protein, reasonable energy. It's basically the outer covering of the almond. It's not to shell. Um, there is a risk of contaminants, sticks, dirt, hard shells, any other foreign material, which can reduce feed value or acceptability. Reasonable energy around about that 10 megs and digestibility 60 to 70 percent. But as I said, they're low in crude protein, principally used as a fibre source, can be some concerns with respect to chemical residues. On to fruit and vegetables. Um, fairly variable when it comes to average dry matter. Um, most, and we'll see a couple in a second, like carrots and potatoes and pumpkins are quite low in dry matter. Crude protein, fairly variable, but generally not too bad. Energy is pretty good. 
And if we look at some examples, carrots, potatoes and pumpkins, just look at those quickly. And that's actually a photo of my brother's couple of cows on our property here two years ago. Um, yep, and it cost me a lot of money to get those carrots, but uh, it's the only way we kept them going, I've got to admit that. But when we're looking at things like carrots, potatoes and pumpkins, high moisture, low fibre feed, so they're costly to transport, reasonable energy and protein and digestibilities. Main concerns are chemical residues, choking, as I mentioned, constipation or prolapse, particularly if they're a really high percentage of their intake, basically because of the lack of fibre uh, in the feed. And again, that moisture content and transport costs. To give an example, um, that photo there shows a grain mix on the left-hand side and a pumpkin, obviously, on the right-hand side. A 60 kilogram U needs about nine megajoules of energy per day. Uh, to achieve that out of these two feeds, <clears throat> she'd have to eat 800 grams of the grain mix or just under 500 grams or five kilos of the pumpkin. Um, that grain mix is about 90%. Dry matter, the pumpkin's 10%. So that means they'd have to eat, a 60 kilogram you would have to eat two of those pumpkins a day to get the equivalent energy on a dry matter base compared to that um, grain mix. Fruit and vegetables, similar sort of thing. We're gonna just look here at um, Great Mark first up. Great Mark is basically um, a waste residue from, um, from the grape processing. Generally low energy and dry matter, reasonable crude protein, but uh, it actually contains a thing called tannins, which can actually bind up or um, minimise protein use. So the feed test may not be uh, the same as the actual. Most energy is in the seeds. Uh, they have reasonable amounts of oil in the seeds. Um, may be indigestible unless it's crushed. Concerns with grape mark, chemical residues. I've long held concerns. Um, they still use copper-based fungicides on, on the grapes. Um, and any copper residues, particularly being fed, if it's a feed source for stock under stress, can well tip them over into copper poisoning. The impact of oil, uh, as I mentioned last week, um, all feeds have some oil component, but uh, ruminant sheep and cattle really can only uh, effectively use up to seven or eight percent in their diet. Rancidity because of that oil content and tannins, which can make the, um, the feed unpalatable. In terms of food waste like bread and cereals, uh, crude protein levels are pretty good. Dry matter, digestible dry matter is pretty good and energy levels are pretty good. Just a word of warning here, particularly with the breads um, or any of these that might contain high, contain high levels of starch, is that it is finely processed and so for a higher risk, as I mentioned last week, um, in terms of acidosis. We just look at bread and cereals. Um, Here's just some example of a producer uh, down around Leeton that actually was getting a lot of the um, uh, Nutrigrain type uh, cereal and was feeding it to his stock quite successfully. So it can be fed out, just be mindful of it. Just quickly on the bread side, particularly um, if, uh, if feeding buns that may contain any meat, just remember that uh, it's illegal to feed uh, meat to ruminants. Um, there's a ban on, on animal products there. And the last one, processed meals. Um, again, we mentioned these last week. They're basically put into the system to up protein. Um, they are quite a good energy con content in them. Um, a lot of it coming from the oil component. The two I just want to quickly mention, copra meal and palm kernel meal, which are both imported. You'll note here from the table that they're reasonably low in protein. Um, and although energy levels aren't too bad, the main concerns I have really are palatability um, and the amount of oil, because a lot of these are actually processed under pressure, um, not chemical process, and so there's a fairly high content of oil in those. A couple other quick ones, cotton seed, we mentioned it again last week. Cotton seed, about one tonne of cotton seed is equivalent to 1.7 tonnes of grain. Uh, cereal grain by volume. So if you're transporting it, the cost per tonne is actually quite high. It has been known to be spontaneously combust if wet or stacked high. It won't auger. You need to use a front end low loader or shovel. Very good energy, protein, fibre and digestibility. Uh, can be reasonably high in oil. Um, stock, self, stock will tend to self-limit 
Um, sheep normally will eat around three to 400, possibly 500 grams a day um, until they sort of reach that maximum oil content in the rough, in the fibre, sorry, in the diet. In terms of how it can be things like gossypol, which is a naturally occurring um, substance in uh, cotton, cotton seed or cotton. Um, my understanding is a lot of our new varieties are quite low in gossypol. Gossypol has been known to cause deaths in pre-ruminant or young um, ruminants. Uh, and it also has been an issue, particularly overseas, for uh, fertility issues, particularly for bulls. Again, the oil content's quite high and we'd have to be mindful of chemical residues. Just a quick couple of slides. This is a, um, a rack, feeding rack, designed by Jeff Betts from Nindy Gully. Um, basically, it's a sliding type system. Um, this is the newer version of it. Uh, he's a, uh, built it so sheep can actually enter through this um, Rio mesh sides. He has a flexible end uh, that allows it to a concertina in and he has these skids here, and basically they, they can just go in, dump a load of cotton seed, um, and the sheep then push the sides in, so minimal waste. Um, and the other one is the less stress for livestock because um, they know the feed's always there. Another one, sprouted grain or fodder. Sprouting converts the starch into sugars and fibre, making it safer to feed. It's a high energy, high protein, and high moisture contents. So dry matter levels are very low in the actual feed. So again, we compare all feeds on a dry matter base. So, but it has major limitations for practical and profitable use in commercial systems, um, including our uh, confinement feeding. Because it's a high cost of production, both the capital to set up the system, depreciation, labour, running costs, etc., the scale of operation, um, the amount of labour involved, handling of very high moisture feeds and the risk and issues with moulds. Um, but again, it's, I guess, another alternate type feed that um, some people may well look into. In terms of fibre, and I'm really big on maintaining fibre content in, in, um, in diets or rations for both sheep and cattle, the rumen is adapted for the digestion of fibre. Fibre's got a lot of positives. It reduces the rate of gut flow, contains enzymes needed for the breakdown of fat and starch. It cleans the rumen walls. It's involved in the recycling of nitrogen in the rumen. It stimulates cud chewing um, and the contractions in, within the rumen. It actually diverts phosphorus away from the urine into the manure, improving the calcium phosphorus balance, which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, and that reduces bladder stone risk. It increases B12 absorption. Again, we're going to talk a bit more about B12, but it's basically needed for energy. It provides additional vitamin D, which is important in terms of the calcium phosphorus balance. Improves magnesium availability and absorption. Increases milk fat. It has so many positives. A rough rule of thumb, if at any one time you see around 40% of the mobile flock um, chewing the cud, generally the fibre level is considered to be okay. A primary driver of effective fibre is the size of it. Target about 25 mil, about an inch long for sheep and 25 to 50 mil for cattle to stimulate that chewing and salivation. Longer lengths can lead to sorting and waste. Chopping or processing the roughage is generally required if included as part of a total mixed ration. Ruin its need basically about 10% of this effective fibre, this stuff that gives the scratch factor in the rumen. Um, a little bit higher in cattle, around about 20%. Basically what we want to form is this fibre mat on top of the rumen contents. So we have our new feed coming in, mixing in, slowly mixing in over time and being re-chewed um, by the sheep or cattle um, to actually maintain a, an efficient rumen. Just a bit of a table on recommended fibre levels. Again, anywhere from 10 to 20%. This table is in the manual. Um, and we also have recommendations there for fibre quality. I'm quite okay with getting most of our vitamins, minerals, energy, protein and the like out of our grain source and just using low quality roughage just to stimulate that rumen. The importance of fibre, that chewing breaks down large fibre particles, promotes the production of saliva. Under normal grazing conditions, sheep and cattle will have about 40,000 jaw movements a day and they produce when doing that bicarb of soda in the saliva. 
and that helps with um, buffering rumen pH and washing feed particles through the rumen. It's important, and this is one issue I guess I have when we're feeding processed feeds like pellets. Um, if we change the the um, the fibre component, it might be the same a little level of fibre per se, but if we change it from say roughage through to a um, process sort of form, what we'll do is actually uh, reduce chewing time. Um, we end up if we don't have enough fibre in the system, we have a rapid gut flow, a drop in rumen motility, changes in the microbe numbers and the percentages, the rumen efficiency drops away, and the likelihood of grain poisoning or acidosis increases. But we can feed grain alone, particularly for sheep. The reason being, every time sheep take a mouthful of grain, 70% of the grain is swallowed whole. So effectively, we have all these little set, little bits of fibre, one to two millimetres in length, which are going into the rumen, which are basically stimulating those rumen walls. One way of checking your fibre, whether or not there's enough in the system, is to check manure. Um, we usually talk about the three Cs, colour, consistency and content. In terms of cattle, the target consistency is there on the screen, uh, describes as a, as a thin pancake batter, um, forms a normal pat uh, with more than an inch thick uh, with a slight centred uh, divot. In sheep, this is probably the target consistency uh, we'd like to see. If you start to see undigested grain, um, it may well indicate uh, in, inadequate fibre uh, and potentially acidosis um, happening. We don't want to see this sort of format. Grey, runny manure, evidence of gas bubbles or undigested starch, which definitely indicates there's a bit of a gut problem going on. Minerals. Cattle and sheep require up to 17 minerals, but most are only needed in small amounts. The major ones that we are generally concerned with are calcium, sodium, phosphorus, and magnesium. If possible, get a mineral analysis of the ration um, to help identify potential deficiencies. Um, that can be reasonably expensive, but it is a great way of actually ensuring that you do have the right minerals in the balance. You can use commercially available broad mineral supplements, either pelleted, dry mixes or blocks. You can do that mineral analysis and seek professional nutritional advice, or you can make your own loose leak up or dry mixes on farm, um, using average mineral content and availability within feeds used. And I'll show you some in a second. You really need to look at the benefit cost of all of the above. Um, when you're feeding uh, livestock, I'll give you my opinion in a couple of minutes. Um, most times you could probably get by without buying commercial blocks and leaks and do it a, a lot cheaper. Just quickly on the minerals, calcium needed for nerves, muscle contraction, blood clotting, activating enzymes and bone formation. If we're feeding energy dense rations, so cereal grain based rations in particular, if they're late pregnant or early lactation or importantly if there's a high potassium intake, requirements for calcium increase. Deficiency symptoms, muscle weakness, paralysis, you know, we, we all know and have seen the hypocalcemia um, um, issue. Potassium, another one important for enzyme function, muscle contraction, nerve impulses, so a lot of the similar things to calcium and magnesium, electrolyte, acid base and water balance. The big issue with potassium, it inhibits magnesium absorption in the room. Often, often results in a doubling of magnesium requirements. So high potassium diets can predispose stock to milk fever and grass tetany. It's important for metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids and protein, nerves, muscle contraction and protecting against milk fever. So magnesium is a bit of a sleeper, but um, and sheep in particular, and I guess cattle are the same, actually need uh, a source of magnesium daily. They don't mobilise their magnesium reserves that well. So high potassium, high calcium, high phosphorus, high nitrogen, basically protein, decrease magnesium availability. Salt and energy increase its availability. Sodium, uh, important for regulating pH, blood pH, muscle contractions, transmission of nerves, maintaining electrolyte and fluid balance. Sheep tend to absorb more sodium in the large intestine, so the last part of the, the gut, 
than cattle, and that explains the higher dry matter content. So sheep manure is uh, inherently um, drier than cattle. Supplementing with sodium will help to minimise the impact of potassium on the magnesium absorption. Now that's really important. I'll show you a table in a second. Importantly also, stress increases sodium requirements and a confinement system is a stressful situation. There's a lot of information on this slide, but I just want to walk you quickly through it. Here we have basically our cereal grains, our pulses, our meals, and our pasture bases, um, our cereal pastures, brassica, canola, and lucerne, and the mineral contents there. What I just want you to concentrate on first up is this calcium to phosphorus relationship, and we need a, a diet to be greater than one and a half calcium to every one phosphorus. Those shown in yellow are all lower than that rate. So basically everything that we feed them, bar most pastures, are uh, out of whack when it comes to calcium and phosphorus. Second one is, is called a grass tetany index. It's a relationship of potassium relative to calcium and magnesium. Sorry, that should be a plus there. And again, if you look at this column here, we want this relationship to calcium, sorry, potassium to calcium and magnesium to be less than 2.2. Pretty much most of our feeds are greater than that. And that predisposes that animal to uh, problems with magnesium absorption. And the last one, the relationship between potassium and sodium, and bang, just about every single feed is low in sodium relative to potassium. And that can also impact on this magnesium absorption issue. So we need to supplement with calcium, magnesium, and sodium. My thoughts. A 221 lime salt cause mag mix, 2211 lime salt cause mag, and perhaps gypsum, particularly if you need to bump sulfur levels up. Uh, for example, if you're a merino or a wool based operation, sulfur is needed for amino acids, important amino acids that make up wool. You can use dolomite and salt in a one to one ratio. Dolomite is basically lime with additional magnesium carbonate in it. You can use acid buff and salt. I'll talk about acid buff in a couple of seconds. Acid buff, salt, and gypsum. So you make up your own licks. I'd have them out year round, but definitely have them in a confinement area. Vitamin A, it's needed for normal bone growth and development, regulating cell growth, reproduction, and light transmission. Most times when we've got animals in a confinement area, they've been off green feed for a while, uh, particularly if it's a drought situation. Um, Vitamin A is produced by conversion of carotene, which is the green pigment in, in grass and, and green feeds. It's stored in the liver so they can have long-term storage. Um, green pastures or hay, leaves and corn are good sources of vitamin A. Importantly, you can have a loss of around about 10% per month in pellets and premixes after the date of manufacture. So, um, just be mindful of that, particularly if you're buying pellets that may have been uh, made a few months in advance. I won't go through that. Vitamin E, it's an antioxidant, so it basically helps with um, infections and the like. It has a role in maintaining cell membranes, occasionally seen in wieners, which have had no green feed for several months. Again, it's fat soluble, so it's stored in the liver for long term. Feeding hay or grain over an extended period like we do in a confinement area. High grain rations with limited or no roughage, especially high moisture grains. High fat levels in a ration and lengthy storage of feeds can all reduce vitamin E levels. Vitamin D, the last one, it has a role in terms of increasing the absorption and the use of calcium and phosphorus. Um, and basically sheep and, uh, and cattle produce it through the skin. Um, and we don't often see vitamin D issues here in Australia because our, uh, we have a lot of sun and we very seldom shed our animals. Green hay is a reasonable source and a good uh, means of counteracting vitamin D deficiency. Um, excessive energy in the diet, again, can interfere with that vitamin D, but uh, in a confinement system, we are basically looking at maintenance, and so we're not likely to have excessive carbohydrates. The last item I just want to quickly talk about is B12. It's actually related to cobalt intake, uh, where cobalt's converted to B12 in the rumen. It's stored in the liver, needed for cell growth, energy production. 
and also wool production. So it's very important. Uh, the main animals will be wieners that may be um, deficient in B12, mainly because the rumen's not fully functional and so they haven't been able to convert cobalt into the B12. The rate of absorption in the small intestines enhanced by slow gut flow. So if we slow the gut down by keeping fibre in there, um, we'll increase B12 absorption. And if the rumen or the small intestine are damaged, uh, for example, with worms, high worm burden, it can interfere with B12 as well. Deficient animals are unable to metabolise propionic acid, which is the main acid produced in the rumen, and turn it into glucose. So it's basically related pretty much to energy. Just so mindful of time, uh, we've got a couple of minutes to go. Just quickly on the additives, acid buff, it's a seaweed extract. It buffers up to four times better than bicarb of soda. Uh, it also buffers for longer. It releases calcium and magnesium into the rumen. Most pellet manufacturers now include acid buff um, and you can buy it yourself and include it in a loose lick. Acid salts, anionic salts, they actually immobilise calcium from the small intestine, acidify urine, which should break down uh, potentially any stones that are forming and can help with the prevention of bladder stones, but they are very bitter. Bentonite, it's a clay, it's not technically a buffer, um, but it swells in size six or seven times its size uh, once it hits moisture. So it slows the gut down, it binds acid ions to its surface and then takes it out through the, uh, through the manure. Bicarb of soda, we mentioned, that's naturally produced by the animals when they chew. So it can actually be used as an additive as well. Cause mag, magnesium oxide, again, not a true buffer. It's actually an alkalinizer um, and a magnesium supplement. I wouldn't necessarily have it there as a um, acid uh, acidosis preventative, but I'd definitely have it in there as a magnesium supplement. Electrolytes, usually glucose, sodium, potassium, bicarb sort of based, um, and sometimes magnesium. We see greater responses in cattle than we do in sheep with the use of electrolytes, particularly when it comes to dressing percent and yields. Ionophores, things like Bovatec, Remensen, not a big fan of those. Uh, I think they'll be out of the system, um, particularly in the sheep job in time because our overseas markets uh, don't want antibiotics and they are basically an antibiotic. Um, they can improve feed conversion. They can reduce acidosis risk. Um, but they may also reduce intake. Your disadvantage is a very small amount per tonne of feed, so you usually need to buy them as a premix. Limestone, dolomite, I've already mentioned those. Molasses and vegetable oils, to my mind, um, they are a good energy source, but the amount that we can actually put into the system, um, we're not getting a great deal back in the energy. Their main roles are really in improving palatability and reducing dust. Salt, we've already discussed that, it's important. All our feeds are pretty well deficient in salt, so we need to um, have that out there as a as a, some sort of additive. Urea, probably more use in cattle than sheep. Um, I, I've never really seen uh, really good responses with adding uh, urea, which is basically NPN or non-protein nitrogen. Uh, we need a really efficient rumen for, to get any response for them. We need adequate energy in the ration. You may need to add, of all things, potassium and sodium, um, and it's very dangerous. So I'd be mindful of that. If possible, I'd recommend to steer clear, particularly on the sheep side. Two more, Virginia mycin or escalin. It's actually an antibiotic, uh, needs veterinary approval, does a very good job at reducing lactic acid producing bug numbers. So stopping those bugs that produce the bad acids that really drop the rumen pH down. It stops them from multiplying. The last one are just quickly a yeast, uh, improved dry matter intake and digestibility, better feed conversion efficiency and improved animal health. Again, you will probably have to buy those as part of a premix. Okay, there we go, boys. No worries, Jeff. Um, we had a question uh, there had a come in the other day that um, just while we're changing over to Jeff House, um, uh, about would you use, make your own dry lick or would you uh, use blocks? Look, I've been pretty open with this right through my professional career, mate. To be honest, um, 
I, I don't think you need to go and buy commercial blocks and leaks under most occasions unless you have a, a definite deficiency of some sort that they're going to correct. Those uh, mixes that I uh, I sort of recommended, the 221 sort of lime salt Cosmac, again, as I showed you through the table there, just about every single feed is deficient in calcium. Magnesium is an issue, particularly if there's high potassium, which most feeds are relative to magnesium, and the importance of keeping um, sodium in there, so salt. So I can't explain why uh, sheep and cattle will actually go to a block or lick. I don't believe they have nutritional wisdom where they think, oh, I'm, I'm low in zinc, I'll go eat that and I'll be right. But it's proven at times that they will preferentially go to licks to counteract um, a potential issue they have mineral imbalance. So, but look, in short, sorry, mate, I think under most um, situations, people can make up their own blocks and licks on farm. Yeah, personal experience with uh, probably Jeff House and myself here, where we've seen grass stetanies, we know you can add other things to some of these mixes, increase palatability, therefore manipulate intakes and actually get them to increase intakes and stuff. So I'd, I'd probably yeah. stick with making your own mix. So I'll hand over to Jeff House. Thanks, Brett. No, I appreciate that. And, I, and for, forward on to that as well. Um, yeah, there's plenty of recipes out there for cattle and using urea in um, in loose licks too. Where Brett Littner and I are not quite so um, scared of urea as what uh, Jeff Duddy is for sheep. So we get, we get better responses in cattle. I think that's it. But we still need to be careful. Look, I'm going to um, move on and, and talk a little bit about water, shade and shelter now um, in confinement feeding areas. Look, Water is, is just, of course, critical. Um, if there's anything that restricts an animal's water intake, then that is also going to restrict its feed intake and cause all sorts of problems. So it's essential that we've got good quality water and that that water is clean. And I'll talk about trough cleaning in a moment. On the same note, um, really for confinement feeding areas, whether it's pens or, or small paddocks, we really strongly recommend that you use troughs. Um, dams in this type of situation tend to um, drop in, in um, amount very quickly and will just tend to bog up and, you know, we end up with issues with quality. We can end up with um, issues with stock getting stuck in, in dams. So, yeah, really strongly encourage people to use troughs. Of course, from an environmental point of view, we can't have our confinement areas going across um, creeks or anything like that. So, yeah, we really do need to, to pipe that water and, and plumb it into troughs. From a, a trough point of view, how much do we need? Uh, in terms of linear sort of space, for sheep, it's 30 centimetres plus 1.5 centimetres per sheep. Um, so whatever number you come up with there, that's the linear amount of, of trough space you need. Likewise for cattle, it's three centimetres per head. So for 100 head of cattle, you need three metres of, of trough space. Now, if that's a trough where they have access from both sides, then, you know, a 1.5 metre long trough will, will comfortably handle that. If they've only got access from one side, then you need the three metres. So it's actually actual linear trough space that we require there. Ideally in a confinement feeding area, we're gonna store two to three days of supply in tanks. Um, and this is just an emergency buffer. So if we have trouble with pumps, uh, if we have trouble with our water supply, then by having that two to three days stored above ground in tanks, then you know ideally that, that can uh, gravity feed down into our um, confinement feeding area, then we've always got that buffer there behind us. Um, really one of the important parts of, of our water supply is making sure it's not so much about the volume that's, that's in the individual troughs, but it's that um, ability to actually get that supply there. So having that flow rate and, and having that supply stored just gives us that backup. Around our water troughs, we really need some form of apron. Now, whether that's concrete, whether it's just compacted gravel, um, you know, we really do need a base there because it's a really high traffic area, like around our feed troughs. 
uh, but also if water's spilt, then it, that area can get quite wet and boggy and, and cause a lot of issues really quickly. So again, we don't want to disrupt animals' ability to get water. So, you know, for sheep, we want about a 1.5 metre apron for cattle, ideally out to about three metres. So that allows an animal to quite comfortably stand on there and, and also for animals to move behind that animal and, um, you know, not end up with a muddy, muddy area. In terms of the actual amount of water we need, um, look, if we work on a minimum of 10% of the animal's body weight, um, that will be, that'll give you a, a bit of a guide. Of course, if it's really hot weather, then, you know, we can add half again to that at least. Um, and likewise, if animals are lactating, so if they're, they're cows or ewes that are lactating, then their water requirements are much higher. So for cattle, you know, generally, um, you know, you, you're talking about somewhere between, you know, for, for light animals, 30 litres, but anywhere up to potentially 100 litres. Um, if you're talking about, you know, hot weather, cows are lactating, um, you know, we can end up with some really big volumes of water that are needed per day, per head. And it's also good to have, um, you know, it's not only the requirement of the animals, but we probably want to have about another 5 to 10% just up our sleeves as a reserve uh, for trough cleaning, for any leaks that we might have in the system so that we've got plenty of water. And anybody that's had to cart water um, during previous droughts or, or supplied in that way, you know, you understand how important water is to the whole system. If it's restricted, then our animal performance is, is really knocked back and, and it, you know, really can make the decision as to whether you actually decide to um, to retain animals and, and to feed them in a confinement feeding area or not is your ability to get that water to them. When we talk about, you know, water needs to be clean, uh, especially for sheep and lambs, even a film of dust on the surface of that water can be enough to um, to restrict their, their water intake. So you, you'll often see um, when you've got a, a long trough like this, um, stock will come and really preferentially drink from the end of the trough that's closest to the float valve because that's the fresh clean water that's actually coming in. It's cleaner and it's also generally a little bit cooler, that water coming in there. So um, we really do need to clean troughs quite regularly. Lots of different designs um, in terms of water troughs. So for sheep, there's a lot of these PVC type designs. Again, it doesn't have to hold a large volume of water but we do need to have the flow rate there so that it can keep it continually topped up. So if the animals come in there and really start to drink heavily, then we, we need to be able to keep that water um, up to those animals. And look, really the amounts of trough space we've talked about, it's sort of allowing about 10% of the mob to, to drink at once. So, you know, we, we need those rates. This is a really good setup here. This, this sort of trough is between two pens. Um, so each pen has, has access to one side. But just that frame over the top there too stops animals from, you know, either putting their front feet in there um, or, or trying to climb into the water troughs at all. And you'll notice at the top there, um, you know, this trough can actually extend outside the pen. Um, so it can allow that, that water to be released out there when you need to clean. Uh, a couple of other designs here for sheep, again, using this pipe, uh, the PVC, where you've got individual holes have been cut out in that one on the left and the one on the right there where big sections have been cut out. Just in both of these examples, there is actually some reinforcing underneath there. Um, so less less needed on the one on the left. Um, there's, there's enough PVC there to, to allow and maintain that structural integrity. The one on the right there with those big sections cut out probably really do need some angle iron or something underneath that, um, some channel, just to make sure that it, it maintains its integrity. Not really suitable for cattle, um, they, they damage those really quickly. So mostly for, for cattle, we're looking at sort of concrete water troughs um, or, you know, some of the PVC troughs and I'll show in a second here. Um, my preference for water troughs is if we can get them up off the ground, um, just reduces the amount of dust and the amount of, of manure and the like that ends up in them. Um, we spoke about positioning last week where ideally you want the water trough you know, pretty much as far away from the feed 
uh, troughing as you can because animals will tend to, to eat. They'll get grain and feed on their, their muzzles and then they'll go and have a drink. And if they're close together, you'd be amazed how much grain and the like they can carry and deposit into the water trough. So you know, ideally we want a bit of distance between them, um, but just be mindful that bottom photo there where you've got troughs that are built up, you will get manure and the like built up underneath them. So you, you may need to go in there and clean that out from time to time. If that gets wet, that will be quite a source of odour. So just be mindful of that. Um, not so much a fan of round troughs. Um, you know, they, they do hold a lot of volume, um, but that's actually a negative when we come to cleaning those troughs. So, you know, troughs that hold a smaller volume of water, you're going to be more inclined to clean them out more regularly and you're not wasting as much water. Photo on the top right there too, showing that float valve um, exposed like that. Look, really, th there's probably nothing wrong with this um, trough in terms of it, it overflowing. It's just that because that float valve's where it is, um, a cattle are going to play with that and they'll push it back underwater. And that's what's then going to result in that water overflowing and causing this, this big mess around the outside of the, the trough. So, you know, we need to be mindful of that. Really don't want sort of dirty water down, like down in that bottom left hand corner. Those sort of tubs, they're good for emergency water. Um, but again, they're, they're difficult to sort of clean out without making a mess in the pen. Um, and so, you know, not ideal as the, the constant water supply. That trough there on the right hand side at the bottom, um, really like those for cattle. Um, the water is actually only quite shallow up in the top, but they're sort of boxed in at the bottom. So you don't get that manure and the like going underneath and causing issues. And look, when it comes to cleaning troughs, really middle of summer, you probably want to be doing it you know, potentially every day, um, daily, just to get that dust off there. Um, be really mindful of where that water goes. So ideally, these bottom photo here on the left, um, they've got a pipe underneath there that actually takes that water out of the pen. Um, but if you're dropping that water every day in the pen, then that can actually start to cause some problems with mud. Another option here, somebody's set up this trough here and they've got a bit of belting. So when they unscrew the cap off the end there, that water runs outside the pen and doesn't cause that that bogging and, and mess. But you really want to set it up with that in mind um, so that you can clean those troughs really regularly, keep that water clear and, and nice and clean and not, not have any impacts on, on intake. The other thing I want to just touch on quickly, um, shade and shelter for cattle in confinement feeding areas. Look, really you know both sheep and cattle um, you know are susceptible to, to heat stress and cold stress um, sheep probably can handle heat a little bit better than cattle uh, but look really sickly uh, from a welfare point of view really strongly encourage people to to provide um, some form of shade or shelter temperature humidity wind and radiation all have an impact on on heat and cold stress in animals um, so you know the from a positive point of view for, for heat, you know, we want wind and we, we want that air movement there in low humidity. But of course, from a cold point of view, um, you know, that wind can really you know, induce cold stress really quickly, especially if animals are wet. So we need to be, be mindful of those. Animal factors, different breeds, of course, are, are more or less susceptible to heat um, in both your sheep and, cat, sheep and cattle. So just be mindful of, of um, different breeds and also animals at different stages of production. Um, so, you know, young lambs, of course, are, are really sensitive um, to both heat and cold stress. Um, but, you know, animals that are producing at a higher level um, and have got higher levels of feed intake. So if, if we're feeding young stock and we're actually feeding them for production, then again, they're more susceptible to heat, heat shock as well, or heat stress. So just be mindful of those individual animal factors. It's really important if we're going to provide shade that we need to provide enough per animal. Uh, in some ways it's almost worse if we provide too little because the animals will actually jam together and can actually result in more problems. Um, so we need to provide enough per animal. We really want to make sure our shade structures are nice and high um, so we generate airflow underneath them and also allow them to dry out at, you know, in, in our shade areas. So um, as the sun moves across during the day, if we're building artificial shade, ideally we, we want it to run in a north-south type direction so that the sun, the footprint from the sun or, or the shade moves 
so that underneath that structure actually gets sun on it at some time during the day. So that just allows it to dry out. From a shelter point of view, um, you know, windbreaks can, can be really important, um, especially against those sort of prevailing um, winds during the winter and during cold weather. Need to be mindful that they don't interfere with um, wind movement during the hot weather. But, you know, if we're, we're often looking at the southern side of those areas where, where some of that wind comes from. And look, if we've got a windbreak, you know, trees, they'll protect, you know, between 25 to 30 times their height. So, you know, if you've got trees that are 10 metres high, then they're providing protection out for 250 to 300 metres uh, from that wind. So that they're really, really effective and, and you know, can protect a big area. In terms of the length of a windbreak, we want it to be about 10 times the height. So again, if, if we've got trees that are about 10 metres high, then ideally we want about 100 metres in length for that windbreak um, to be really effective. And, and of course, at 90 degrees to that prevailing wind. So um, windbreaks are really good. Trees, um, you know, provide a, a really good uh, windbreak to protect from, from wind and the like. In terms of, you know, um, the structure of a windbreak, you know, trees on the side of a pen like that, um, you know, will, will give a fair bit of protection. They'll also provide some shade during summer. The, the challenge with trees on the outside of a pen um, is that often in the middle of the day, that shade's not available. So at the hottest time of the day, that shade's not available. But we've got to be really careful if we've got shade trees in the middle of a pen um, that the animals don't damage them either. So, um, you know, tree, trees can be really, really good, but we do need to be a bit careful of them. Um, if they're in there with no protection, then, you know, sheep or cattle will tend to chew the bark. And look, again, I, I don't think that's necessarily a sign of, of any deficiency in the diet or even, you know, a lack of roughage in the diet. Um, it's just when we're feeding them in a confinement feeding area, they're spending so much less time grazing um, that it's. I think it's almost a bit of a novelty or or an activity that they they can get into the habit of doing and they can cause a lot of damage really quickly. So we do really need to make sure that we protect our trees if they're within the pens. Um, even just animals rubbing against them can do a fair amount of damage and um, cause a bit of ring bark um, ring barking. So yeah, we we just need to protect them and and make sure that they're they're not being attacked. The other thing we need to be a little bit careful of as well is, is especially trees that are on the, the lower side um, of our, our confinement feeding areas. Most of our native trees don't handle phosphorus particularly well. So the buildup of nutrients that can be from runoff water and, and manure and the like going down out of the pen over time will unfortunately cause the death of a lot of our trees. Likewise, trees that are in areas um, inside pens that are used a, a fair bit um, we can that nutrient buildup can actually cause issues with um, with their their longevity. So um, just be mindful of that. Trees down the side, um, sort of on the side of the slope, tend to to handle that better than than trees at the, at the bottom of the pens. Artificial shade. There's plenty of structures out there that we can we can provide. This is one for sheep. Um, you know, we're looking at about sort of 0.6 of a metre per head. Um, for sheep, 0.6 of a square metre per, per head for sheep in, in terms of shade area. Uh, for cattle, look, there's a number of different structures that are available. The, the top two there are in, well, actually all three of these are in commercial feedlots. Um, using shade cloth, look, they don't have to be um, as elaborate as these types of structures, but be mindful that you want them nice and high so that um, if you've got machinery or anything moving in there in the pen, that they're not going to interfere with that. Um, and also, again, just to generate that airflow underneath and allow those pens to dry out. Height's really important. Also, if it's in a pen situation, I also strongly recommend that, you know, you, your shade structure doesn't actually cover either the water trough or the feed trough, um, especially for cattle. If you're actually covering either of those, you can end up with, with issues because the stock um, will tend to lie down and congregate under the shade and it can actually block access to other animals either getting to water or feed. So um, preferably if your feed troughs at the front of the pen, uh, your water troughs at the lower section at the back of the pen, then you know shade running across the middle of the pen is, is ideal. Um, if you do happen to have it over the feed or the water trough, you just gotta make sure that you've got plenty of it. Um, so you probably wanna even be at the higher amounts 
of the allowances. So for cattle, you want at least two square metres per head. Um, so yeah, yeah you, you probably even want a bit more than that if it's if it's running over the feed trough or the water trough. Just so that you allow animals to get in there and, and still allow the others to to spread out a little bit. And look, that's all I had for for shade and shelter and water. Um, I'll hand back now to Brett and Jeff can carry on with his presentation. Thanks, Thanks very Mark. much, Jeff. Um, just uh, one thing uh, with uh, before we go through to the next water. Um, the last drought, um, I had a person text message me um, while you were presenting saying um, that there has been in some places during that last, last drought with some of the ball water that there was a change of quality. Um, and, you know, did we see that or were we aware of it? I know I saw it, definitely saw it on some places. Did you see that with some of your stuff? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and that's as and it's something that's, it's a really good point actually if you know if you're using groundwater um, really important that you're monitoring the depth of the water that it's coming from um, you know there was some really some um, some of the aquifers were pulled down a long way in that last drought even to the extent where yeah flow rates were were insufficient to maintain um, you know the numbers of animals that were were on on confinement feeding areas and yeah, it's really important that you um, you monitor that water as those levels dropped. Um, yes, you can definitely get changes in quality, uh, higher amounts of salt and the like. So in the reference manual, there, there's a lot of detail there about water quality and what to look for. Um, but yeah, make sure you're monitoring that water uh, as you go right the way through. And especially if the depth's changing on those um, on that groundwater. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And I'll hand over to Jeff. Uh... Duddy, who's very good at changing slides on the uh, go. I just saw that, Duddy. <laughs> was that a typo you were fixing, Duddy? No, it wasn't a typo, no. <laughs> All right, so you can hear me okay, good. All right, we'll just go uh, before Jeff finishes up with the tools and calculators and that sort of thing. We'll go through some health and welfare issues. Um, this is what I was changing on the slide. I just dropped a few words out, people. The welfare of animals in confinement areas, it's a priority, okay? It's, um, there's just no reason not to meet all welfare requirements. Correct design, construction and management of confinement feeding areas can ensure that five freedoms and provisions are met. Uh, what are these five freedoms? It's freedom from thirst, hunger, malnutrition, discomfort, pain, injury and disease, their ability to express normal behaviour, the fifth one is uh, freedom from fear and distress. Uh, just with a sub note, by ensuring conditions and treatments which avoid mental suffering. I'm really big on the social aspect uh, or the social stress side in confinement areas and feedlot areas. And I just quickly want to uh, show you a couple of things that uh, I think will help reduce stress. Um, and reducing stress, alleviating stress is going to reduce the risk of a lot of these health and welfare issues. This is some trial work um, where they had an enriched pen versus a normal feedlot or confinement pen. The enriched pen had things for the lambs to do stuff on. Um, those lambs that were had an enriched environment had greater average daily growth rates, heavier carcasses, better dressing percentages, and lower meat pH, which is a higher quality meat. Those in a normal situation, greater stress, mobilised more of their body reserves and had lower levels of immunity. So giving them something to do, keep them involved, keep them happy, and we can reduce a lot of these issues in terms of stress. Some of the things I recommend, look, give them something to climb on. If you've got some logs, fallen trees and the like with the uh, sheep side, let them climb on it. Um, for cattle, give them something to roll or play or scratch on. Just something to break up the tedium and the boredom. There are many diseases that can affect sheep and cattle when we confinement feed. The manual outlines many of the health and disease issues and they group them in terms of how they present or common presentations such as sudden death, things like acidosis, feedlot bloat, urea, ammonia toxicity, um, nitrate or nitrite poisoning and enterotoxemia, pulpy kidney, the digestive system, skin and eye diseases, respiratory, respiratory diseases, neurological and lameness diseases, urinary tract diseases, respiratory diseases, 
miscellaneous, like mouldy feeds and mycotoxins. It's, it's not an exhaustive list, but we do cover most of the um, issues we do see in confinement. Uh, just a note, it is important to seek veterinary advice. Um, in New South Wales, you have free access to the local land service um, vets and or if you want to go to a private vet, um, get, get it diagnosed early if you do have a problem uh, and go about checking and, and um, correcting that issue. Just to go through some of these, acidosis um, and also laminitis. Um, laminitis is another term of founder, like founder that horses have. Grain poisoning, as I mentioned last week, we don't really like using that term because you can get acidosis from other feeds. Uh, it doesn't have to be grain based. Um, grain overload or engorgement, it's caused by a rapid starch fermentation in the rumen. All this lactic acid is produced, the rumen pH drops, the bugs die, the, sh the animal becomes dehydrated, um, and if not got too early enough, uh, may well die. Um, dehydration, scouring may well be an issue, abdominal pain, bloating, um, lameness, recumbency and death. All right, and it's probably the main issue we face uh, in confinement areas, again, because we are principally feeding to your grains. The first thing that kill sheep or cattle, though, with engorgement is actually bloat. It's an inability to belch out that gas and break down the foam that's in the room. Pressure builds up um, and they die from asphyxiation. One way of uh, correcting or, or, or um, fixing the problem is to actually get them up and moving, um, bloat them, sorry, bloat them. Drench them with some vegetable oil to help move uh, and break down that um, foam in, in the stomach. Another one which really comes about when sheep are stressed or cattle are stressed, um, and particularly in confinement areas, it's coccidiosis. It's a protozoan parasite. It's present in all sheep. It usually causes scouring, a dark scour, and sometimes there'll be blood in the scour. You need to isolate and drench affected animals and avoid feeding on the ground where possible because they are actually picking up the contaminants um, if we don't have some sort of troughing there available and keep that troughing clean. Pulpy kidney, uh, again, it's one of the more common ones. Uh, definitely look at vaccinating all animals prior to putting them into a confinement area. It's a clostridial disease. It can occur with a sudden change in diet, including change to a grain diet, grain based diet. And most times you don't see too many symptoms, you just see death. You may see tremors or convulsions um, if you see them early enough, frothing at the mouth and teeth grinding and that sort of thing. Bladder stones, it's also known as water belly, urolithiasis, um, principally occurs in weathers or uh, male stock. Um, basically what happens, it's due to a imbalance most times between calcium and phosphorus. Um, Stones form in the, in the urinary tract. They block um, the urethra. Uh, a lot of times the bladder will actually burst from pressure. Um, symptoms, symptoms can include depression. They drop off in feed intake. They are hunched appearance um, and swollen belly or penis. These are just some photos I took of some lambs uh, that we had in a trial that we had to finish that trial early because those particular lambs broke down with bladder stones and the stones in the kidney. Um, usually prevented through ensuring we've got calcium supplements and salt and fibre. Um, you can also use acid salts, as I mentioned, and ionic salts. Keep the water quality high so we have good water intake and up to 4% um, salt in the diet to induce that flushing of the system. Pink eye uh, caused by mycoplasma and chlamydia. Exacerbated by crowding, dusty conditions and flies. Most times our confinement feeding is going to be during the summer period. Um, try and avoid dusty feeds, poor quality hay and or grain or pelleted rations with high levels of fines in them. Um, one of the big issues, I guess, is using a poor quality hay or straws. Um, and particularly if you're feeding with in sheep, in sh feeding sheep in this occasion and they're eating it from underneath or eating a, a rack a hay rack from underneath the rack and getting all that dust and grass seeds in the eyes, it can really cause problems. Remove affected animals. The treatment cost benefit is high. There is a vaccine available for cattle. Uh, I don't believe there's one available for sheep. 
Pneumonia, another one that uh, is a bit of a sleeper. You don't always see this, um, but it could well be there and causing an underlying problem. Usually occurs 10 to 14 days after entering a feedlot or confinement area. Um, and it's related to stress and reduced resistance to the bug. Humid and or dry, dusty conditions and, and dry feeds increase the risk as well. Signs can include coughing, nasal discharge, ill thrift and death. Another one is prolapse. Certainly see a lot of this um, in, in lambs within um, confinement areas. Uh, high risk if they're females. Uh, if they're short dock tails, if it's dusty conditions, if they're over fat, or if there's not enough fibre in the diet, and that basically causes constipation. That combined with dusty conditions and coughing and straining um, can cause rectal prolapse in particular. And that's pretty well that. So we've got any questions on the health and disease side? Um, I've got one for you, Jeff. Um, we've seen a lot of people have gone and got a lot of those overhead hay racks. You've mentioned them. Um, you know, we, we saw a lot of problems with them. What are your thoughts with, with sheep, with and particularly ones that are overheads that are cattle that have been adapted for sheep? Yeah, yeah mate. I, I actually call them cattle hay racks. Uh, I really don't like sheep eating from underneath the feed. We're just asking for problems. There are commercial racks out there that um, look to minimise waste and, and the like. Um, they're getting close. I don't think there's one perfect rack yet. Uh, and they're quite costly. But if you look at the uh, the loss and the wastage levels, like we might have 30 40% wastage level in some feed, some, some haze or, or straws in particular. So if we can minimise waste by um, making animals work for it in a, in a sliding gate type rack, I think they're the best ones for sheep. Um, a lot of the cattle, more so than sheep, will actually be um, basing the ration on a total mix ration. So they have the equipment on farm to include the fibre uh, in with the in with the um, grain or pelleted mix. So, uh, look, it can be really costly, uh, a lot of wastage. But um, as I said, there's some commercial racks that are doing a good job, but uh, I don't think they're quite there yet to um, to reach their full potential. Thanks, sir, Jeff. Um, Jeff House, I know there's also um, been a bit of thought about some of the enriched environments, but also size of mobs and the effect that has on on the welfare and that. Just your thoughts? Yeah, look, absolutely. I think um, we touched on a little bit last week with, with mob sizes. You know, I, really from a from a weaner cattle point of view. Look, you know, you don't want any more than, um, you know, 50, 50, 100 absolute tops, you know, mob size. Um, as as the mobs get bigger, uh, it really makes it much harder for us just to observe those animals and, and to, to look after them. But also within the mobs, um, the the structure, the, the social structure that's established, there's been a little bit of work to suggest that, you know, mobs over 100 with cattle, um, animals really struggle to maintain a, a constant um, sort of hierarchy and, and structure within that mob. So that means that there's more um, negative interactions with animals. So really, the, the more you can keep those mobs down to, to those sort of smaller sizes and, you know, and the same sort of thing in sheep, then, you know, the better the outcome will be for those animals. The easier it is for, for people to monitor them and just look out for sick or, or injured animals. Um, so, yeah, it really does does have quite an impact. Yeah, just on that monitoring, really important. Don't try to monitor the whole mob. Try to pick individuals. I know, man, you have spoken about my wife's favourite cow, 481. You know, <laughs> she was always one of the favourite ones. Uh, we had another cow that had a white quarter, you know, some ear tags that you can actually identify some animals. And, and Jeff Duddy, same same as well. Don't try to assess more, but definitely pick a core group that you're keeping an eye on and monitoring and, and, and tracking their changes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of, uh, well, confinement feeding, particularly for mature stock, we're not so much looking into growth rates and that sort of thing, but at least maintaining condition. And uh, if you want to monitor weight-wise and that sort of thing or condition-wise, do it uh, quietly. Um, yeah, and do the same animals. 
um, and just try and minimise stress because every bit of stress you put on them sort of puts them back. Yeah, I'd, I'd just reiterate that as well. If if you need to weigh animals, um, you know, sometimes people can get a little bit, because we talk about feed, um, you know, we, we allocate feed based on animal weight. Look, just be really careful. If you take those animals out of a pen, even if you do it really quietly and really well, if you take them out, run them over the scales and bring them back to the pen, it's really going to take a day or two to get them back onto feed, and that's best case, get them back fully onto feed properly. Um, if if it, something goes wrong and they're out of the pen for an extended period of time, it can take a week to turn turn cattle around especially and, and get them growing again. Um, so, yeah, really just be a bit careful about, um, you know, taking animal stock out of the pen and weighing them uh, because, yeah, that can actually cause a lot more problems. From a cattle point of view, we really encourage, but when you're looking at animals from a health point of view, um, that you're actually moving around the pen really quietly, but you're making animal, every animal stand every day. Um, so you're seeing them. Now you can do that when you, you feed out and you know just watch the animals come up to the, the feed and the like. Um, but if there's animals lying down at the back of the pen, just make sure you go up to them quietly, make them stand up and, and really double check that there's nothing wrong with those animals. Um, and look at time of feeding is is a really good time to do that because the animals are going to be more active and moving around. But you've got to make sure that you check every animal every day. Thanks, Jeff, and we'll hand over to you. We'll keep you going yeah. on just budget. Pull up my, my next slide. Look, this one's really quick. Um, I just want to touch on some of the the tools that are out there and calculators and and you know some of the resources that are available to you. Look, there's a couple of DPI um, little calculators now that are available that you can use on your phone. Um, and the first one, there's the, the drought feed calculator. Look, this is a really simple um, little calculator here. It allows you, firstly, the, there's a few things you can do with it. So as has been mentioned right the way through, we, we talk about feeds on a dry matter basis. So this calculator can allow you to compare feeds um, so at the top there uh, it's got a whole heap of default feeds um, in there but you can change any of these numbers underneath so that, you know the cost on farm what, what is costing you to land that feed on farm what its dry matter percentage is and there'll be a default value that comes in there but if you've actually got a feed test value that's even better likewise for energy and crude protein and then down the bottom there it, it actually calculates once you put that data in you know, what's it costing you um, per megajoule or megajoules per tonne as fed? Um, what's the cents per megajoule? Um, and again, so that's converting on a dry matter basis. What's the cost in dollars per kilo of protein on a dry matter basis? And what's your, your cost in dollars per tonne on a dry matter basis? So, you know, for something like barley that's 90% dry matter, you know, there's not massive differences there, but if you were to put something in that looks like a really cheap feed, for example, like your carrots or, or pumpkins or something like that, um, you know, that dry matter percentage really bumps up that cost uh, in cents per megajoule. So, you know, often that's why our cereal grains are, um, you know, invariably in most droughts, our cereal grains are the cheapest um, form of energy on a, on a cents per megajoule dry matter basis. Now, this calculator lets you enter three feeds at a time. It then allows you to put that into a bit of a mix um, at different percentages of those three feeds and then take it a step further and look at um, feeding that to different classes of livestock. And it does a simple calculation based on, on megajoules of energy as to how much you'd actually have to feed to animals. So it's a really straightforward, simple little calculator there that you, know, you can use on your phone um, and, and quite straightforward. The other one, again, this is another DPI um, calculator again that you can get on your phone. Um, this is the drought and supplementary feeding calculator. Now it, it does much the same as the last one in, in terms of what you can use it for, but it allows you also to include um, pasture in this one as well. So in, in terms of um, looking at a ration for stock, it allows you to include different feedstuffs, but it also allows you to take um, account of pasture. So it's probably you know, it's something you, you might use a little bit earlier um, when you've still got paddock feed and, and you're maybe looking to supplement in the paddock before you've gone to 
to full confinement feeding. Um, and again, it'll allow you to calculate how much feed you need uh, for different classes of stock and different targets. So really handy sort of calculator there that, that allows that um, you to, to calculate both there. And look, you know, this, this could be a really handy calculator as you're coming back out of drought. Um, you've got that green feed that's that's grown away. Just balancing back whether you need to to still add some supplements to to that sort of feed to to keep those animals going. So yeah, again, really handy, available for on your phone. Um, the next one, there's a couple of other calculators. So Grads Feed, it's a computer program. Um, look, as beef extension officers, it, it was one of those programs we used extensively. Anybody that's done prograze, um, look, a lot of the principles of prograze are around understanding the, the principles and, and what the inputs are into grass feed. It allows you to both um, in a pasture situation, but also a, a supplementary feeding or a confinement feeding uh, allows you to calculate, you know, what's available enter all that information in there and it'll predict performance um, on, on a whole range of classes of animals based on that feed you provide there. So really, really strong program, um, you know, wouldn't be caught dead without it um, when, when advising producers and, and working with producers from a nutrition point of view. Uh, it's available, um, if you Google grass feed, uh, it's available for, for purchase. Um, but yeah, look, really, really good quality program. That one that um, you know, you, we use it uh, almost all the time um, during drought, just for doing calculations. Uh, but likewise, it can be used on green feed at any time of the year. The last one down here too. This is the uh, um, feedlot calculator that that Jeff Duddy uh, developed um, with the um, a couple of his his former colleagues there with the department. Um, as part of the sheep CRC. So it's a, a, a spreadsheet based um, calculator there that allows you to do some budgeting and the like as well. So again, really handy little little resource that's available on the web. Uh, again, it's it's downloadable from the DPI website. So some really good um, resources available there. Look, in terms of, of written resources, um, we probably should have had this conversation before we started this evening, but. Um, is the the gu a guide to confinement feeding sheep and cattle in New South Wales, um, by put out by the Central Tablelands Local Land Services. That's basically the document, um, the reference manual that this this uh, webinar series has been based on. It will be available from from the LLS um, in the next little while, so um, people will be notified when that document becomes available. And yeah, really encourage you to go back and. Um, basically, the topics we've covered in this webinar are the chapters in that manual, and it's got a lot more detail and, you know, really encourage people to, to get a copy of that when it's available. Another good um, publication is the um, New South Wales DPI Managing Drought Guide. Um, and Jeff Duddy last week when he was um, calculating those quantities of feed to be fed, um, those tables are included in this, this Managing Drought Guide that's put out by the, the New South Wales DPI. Again, it's a really good resource. Um, there's a lot of information there about feeding as well, and, and it's regularly updated. So I think that that version there that's on the screen was from 2019. Um, it's in its ninth edition. So yeah, again, a really good resource that can be downloaded from the internet. And also um, sort of in terms of, of drought management, you've got the, the New South Wales DPI Drought Hub, um, which, you know, that links to a lot of resources both within DPI and, and local land services and is a really good, um, really broad avenue of, of assistance um, during drought for, for producers. So really encourage you to, um, to look at those. And yeah, again, when the um, confinement feeding guide becomes available, uh, you will receive a, a notification and uh, encourage you to look through back through that because it, it really does include all of the information we've presented in this webinar um, and a lot more detail and, and a lot more information there as well. But yeah, just to finish off, um, this is the sort of last slide I've got. Um, look, again, I'm happy if, if people have got questions or queries, um, you know, following up after this, more than happy to um, to assist anyone. And I'm sure likewise, Brett and, and Jeff um, would be the same. So 
yeah, encourage people to get in contact with with any of us if um, if you've got specific questions that we we don't touch on tonight. Thanks, Brett. Thanks very much, Jeff. Look, probably one of the other suggestions I would have is if if you get the chance and go and have a look at um, it's easy our plan. Uh, <laughs> Once, once COVID willing, we're allowed to get out and actually go and do some inspections at a few uh, places that people have actually got. So, so be be on the lookout. Uh, the manual we actually have got quite a few photos of different setups um, that that will be in there. But what I would do is go out and have a look, um, peg it out, think about it, um, and and really a bit of time can save a lot of effort down the, the track. Um, you know, have a look, ask people what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, the, the two Jeffs and myself, I know we've seen a lot of them. You go out and it's, I was at a place there um, during the drought and I sort of said to the guy, I said, oh, these gates, I said, how you go when you get a bit of rain? And he goes, yeah, too tight. <laughs> Um, it's it's quite interesting. Um, some of these things you can just walk in there and go right. That doesn't work. You ask the person where are your issues, where's the shortcomings, um, and they'll soon critique it for you. And and I would say I've got a lot of learning from going out and actually having a look at different setups. Um, but what I would say is um, we've seen a few photos in the presentations that look uh, pretty flash. Um, I'm a simple guy. I think KISS works really well. Keep, keep it simple, stupid. Um, you know, different different things uh, can work quite easily. Um, and, and just really probably one of the things that I would say is spend some time, have a look at the animals when you do start feeding them and start to see what, what behaviour, some little bits and pieces that you'll see. You'll pick up issues early and you can see, okay, that I can fix that there. Um, so just, just Jeff Duddy, you got anything to say at the end? No. Um, what I would say is, um, sorry. We've lost him. I, I think I, I just no, make I'm a... Here, mate. I, was, yeah. I was muted. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, look, I, I agree 100% what you're saying, Brett and Jeff. Um, a lot of the... I guess success that comes out of confinement feeding is just doing the simple things um, and monitoring and keeping an eye out. Um, and look, there are people here in industry that are um, available to help out. So by all means, and the manual is going to be a, a really good resource. So when it's um, available, yeah, I'd say you definitely look at getting into it. Thanks very much. Um, Peter, are you going to send the um survey out to the participants this evening? Yep, so there'll be a, an email in your inbox um, sometime this evening. Uh, if you could just spend five minutes um, just giving us some feedback on tonight as well as some other um, information that we, we just need to collect as part of our requirements to the to the funding bodies that, that, that allow us to put, put these webinars and things on. So, yep. I'll also send out the link to the recordings um, once we get them up on our YouTube channel. So I won't, won't email the link like I have done last week. It'll go up on our, our YouTube channel and then you'll be free, you can freely um, promote that, that link to anyone who would like to watch the webinars at a later date. Well, we might finish it there this evening uh, unless anyone's got some questions. Uh, but feel free to forward those questions if you... Um, uh, email them through to myself, the two Jeffs or, or Peter, um, and we can uh, collate them and get them get some answers back to the people. The other thing I will endeavour is that we will try to get um, the copy of the presentations uh, PDF and send out to the, the people who've registered. Um, so thank you very, very much. If there's no questions, uh, we'll finish it off there. Really appreciate it. Um, Jeff Duddy and Jeff House, the experience and knowledge and sharing that this evening. Um, thanks, Pete, for the effort. And thanks, everyone, for coming along and uh, spending your time this evening listening to the presentation. Thank you. Well done, boys. Thank you.